So, uh, uh, <coughs> I would like now briefly to repeat what we did uh, in the end. So, in the end, if this is discharge uh, deterministic output, the thin line, the gray line is uh, formed, gray interval is formed by plotting every for every time step the 90% interval conf of conf confidence bounds. So 90% uh, is called confidence interval and the in, uh, in percentage and uh, the resulting interval is called confidence bounds. So this is uh, uh, the interval between 5% and 95% quantile of this distribution for every time step. So when we put these gray intervals on top of each other, you get this gray uh, uh, output. Okay. Uh, so that's what we get. And uh, can you talk about overall model uncertainty here? So look, we can analyze model uncertainty for each time step. But what is the overall model uncertainty for that period of time? So it's not directly calculated. What we could do, we could of course look at sigma variance yeah, of this output, and this will give you indication if you calculate average uh, standard deviation, for example, or variance, this gives you indication of the variability of output due to uncertainty in parameters. So that's the way to judge about it. But uh, please note, every time this distribution is different for every time step. So, uh, okay, this slide simply represents the Monte Carlo uh, simulation framework. We discussed it, so no need to go again uh, through this whole thing. It just uh, formalizes this as a flow chart diagram. So it's the same thing. So when do we stop, by the way, convergence? So convergence of uh, Monte Carlo is uh, not, well, it's an issue, but uh, basically principle is this. When your mean value of what you're calculating stop changing, stop Monte Carlo. So if you uh, uh, running model once only, then it's easy to see, but if you're running model many times, <coughs> you simply have to look at several distributions that you're generating mean value of these distributions would go up and down, but it will, would then saturate at a certain, as you increase number of runs, it would not change too much, and this is when you stop. You can also develop more accurate ways to judge how long you should run the Monte Carlo, but often there is no need, you just look at this mean or standard deviation, they would stabilize stop then, okay? So often you need a lot of runs, simply. Hundreds of thousands of runs to have accurate estimates uh, of your distribution. Economic sampling. So what we discussed here was independent sampling of all parameters. Okay. By the way, parameters are uh, often uh, uh, dependent, so they form joint distribution, but often we don't know this joint distribution. So that's why we assume independence in parameters and sample them separately. But statistically, statisticians say it's wrong, but they cannot offer you any, anything else. So un unless you know joint distribution of parameters, then you sample the uh, parameters together from a joint distribution. But where to get it? That's a question. Now, uh, if you sample them separately, you need <coughs> to cover the space of parameters. Imagine you have eight parameters to sample. It's eight-dimensional space. We discussed how many uh, model runs you need for calibration. Same here. Uh, so, large number of runs. How to economize? Uh, we can use structured sampling, so-called structured sampling. One of the methods is called Latin hypercube sampling, suggested by McCain in 79, and there are also other versions uh, of it. Idea here is this. Imagine you have two parameters. This is CDF of parameter 1, and this is CDF of parameter 2. If we sample them independently, and we want to cover this space, we can do it, no problem. Sampling independently, and it would be random. You remember pure random search? It would be this picture. But what we can do, we can do uh, structured sampling uh, doing this. Let's say that we want to 
cover the space more or less evenly using the following strategy. For the this range of parameter one, parameter sorry, for this range of parameter one, this range, we uh, think it would be enough to have only one sample for one of the ranges of parameter two. These ranges are uh, probabilistically the same. They are different in terms of real values, but probability for data to fall in this range every time is 20% if we have five ranges. You see it? So for this range of parameter one, we choose this one and we put a point. Then for the next range of parameter one, we choose another range of parameter two and we put a point. For the third range, we choose another range and so on. So you see there is no repetition. So there, there is no point in that range of parameter two and there is no point, on, uh, exactly one point to sample for the, this range. That's called latent hypercube sampling. And how to choose this point? It's chosen randomly inside the range. So randomization come inside the range but not in between ranges. Uh, this allows you to have uh, only five samples, you see, and sort of cover the space evenly. If you select here 25 ranges for each parameter, you need 25 samples and not squared. So you don't need 25 samples here, you need only five. So that's an econo economical way uh, to sample uh, for Monte Carlo, widely used. You can find it in literature that people say for sampling we use latent hypercube sampling. It's this. Okay, let's skip this. Now, uh, we could talk about Bayesian theorem and maximum likelihood. We don't have time for this. If you want to know theory, you're welcome uh, to read it. This is uh, log likelihood. Sorry, this is likelihood as we did. It's the same thing. And this is, you see, log likelihood. Uh, so that we, instead of uh, multiplication, we use addition. Uh, uh, function here is now Gaussian. So you remember we used Gumbel distribution in the first example. Here we assume error is Gaussian, which is often uh, the assumption. And if we solve this problem of maximizing likelihood, finding optimal parameters of mean and sigma, So if we maximize the likelihood, we have to uh, minimize this thing because there is minus, you see, and this is fixed. So if we minimize this, uh, it means epsilon is the error and it's squared because in Gaussian distribution, this is squared. So if we write it down, we have to minimize uh, squared uh, difference between the model output and the measured output. Conclusion, if we assume Gaussian error, optimal estimator of the error is a summation of squared differences. That's why mean squared error. That's the reason, because if we maximize likelihood, you get this. So uh, mean squared, minimizing squared error of model against observation and choose maximum likelihood. So this is theoretically correct way to estimate model performance. Assuming error is, zero, is Gaussian. If error is not Gaussian, this is not optimal way to estimate model performance. It should be different. But often people ignore it. Even if not error is not Gaussian, nobody checks that. And we often use mean squared error or root mean squared error to estimate model performance. That's how it is. Okay, let's skip this. Sorry for that. We don't have time, unfortunately. Yeah, glue method. Yeah, okay, glue. So, um, glue method, well, Bevin with the co-author suggested method which was known before in other sciences, but he brought it to hydrology in 92. And uh, idea is quite simple. So we uh, uh, say this. No, actually, glue method is Monte Carlo simulation method, nothing else, except that 
we would not take into account bad models when we uh, generate using Monte Carlo sampling, different models using, so we sample parameters. In, in this way, we generate different models, of course, because every parameter vector means dif a different model. Same structure, but different parameterization, okay? And when we calculate final PDF, output PDF, we do not take into account bad models. That's the principle of glue. You remember, I showed you a spaghetti of 1,000 models. Some of them were good. I mean, you can calculate error for each model, right? Some of them are not good. So if we impose a threshold for the nash sutcliffe efficiency of 0 0.7, for example, we would leave in that spaghetti set only models with the nash sutcliffe efficiency higher than 0 0.7. That's principle of glue, nothing else. The rest is Monte Carlo. It's widely used in hydrology because uh, Bavin is an influential person, and uh, why not? You can do it. But remember, statistically, it's not correct because you change distribution, removing some of the samples. So there was criticism of glue method by uh, Montavar and uh, Todini paper and Stadingen paper, which criticized uh, glue for not being Bayesian because you remove some of the samples. Fine, you remove, you are not statistically correct, but a positive idea of glue is that you leave only good models, so you don't take into account bad models. Okay, so that's yet another way of looking at Monte Carlo analysis. So additional thing is removing uh, inaccurate models from the further consideration. That's glue. Yes, and uh, the principle behind glue is equifinality. Okay, so that's a bit, the uh, story is this, that uh, equifinality means that let's keep all the good models. We, we, we should not be aiming at selecting a single best optimal calibrated model, but let's keep all the models which are good. For example, with Nash Sutcliffe above 0 0.8 or 0 0.7, whatever. That's the principle. Uh, of equifinality. But in practice, it's not used. In practice, a uh, decision maker wants to have single model and not many models. So that's a bit uh, how it is. But I agree that uh, if you have several models, you, you make an ensemble of them. Maybe not giving any weight, giving equal weights to them, because data is uncertain. So uh, calculation of error if one model is 0, 0.9, another one is 0, 0.8, who said 0, 0.9 is correct? Nobody said because data is an, uh, inaccurate. So maybe we should give them equal weight, create an ensemble, and this would be our final modeling exercise, to have ensemble of good models, all equifinal, sort of equal in rights, and average the output, and this is your output. So it's sort of ensemble modeling. That's a principle of uh, equifinality. If you want to read more, read um, papers of uh, Bavin with co-authors uh, in Lancaster University, and uh, you will learn more. So, but again, this uncertainty analysis is based on Monte Carlo, on sampling, and on judging about uncertainty, looking at uh, distribution of model outputs. Okay, glue model. Now, sensitivity analysis. You remember when we discussed theory of modeling, we said you should do sensitivity analysis. So what is sensitivity analysis? Sensitivity analysis uh, is a principle, not a principle, but uh, the way to analyze the model uh, impact of changes in parameters or inputs on model output. So we change input slightly and look what's happening with the model output. So that's the main principle. Okay, there are different types of sensitivity analysis. There is local sensitivity analysis, global sensitivity analysis. You can read books of Saltelli. Uh, you can also check the paper of Razavi Gupta where they uh, talk about uh, the maybe sort of fresh approach, fresh look at the sensitivity analysis. Also, uh, Torsten Wagener and Francesca Pianozzi 
suggested uh, and published uh, a number of papers. There is quite a lot of literature uh, about this. Uh, there are good review papers, uh, so please check. So there are different, different methods uh, of this. So let's first look at the local sensitivity analysis. Imagine you have a model with two parameters, P1, P2, and Y is the output of that model on this plot, okay? So this is the optimal calibrated set of parameters, P1 star and P2 star, achieved by calibration. So when we run the model for that value, we get output Y, okay? One single, one time step, one output. What we do now for sensitivity analysis, for the local sensitivity analysis, we add, say, 10%, 5% of the value of the parameter to it, some fixed value, and in this way, we slightly update the optimal vector to a bit less optimal vector. And then we calculate the output of the model. So output will be different. So, and then we calculate uh, sensitivity index with respect to parameter one change and with respect to parameter two change. So, ratio of change in the model divided by change in the parameter gives you sensitivity index. That's it. Quite simple. You can arrange it differently. You can change parameters at the same time. Or you can do one at a time, OAT, so to say, one at a time, OAT, and, and so on. So, But typically it's done one at a time, so you fix all parameters at optimal value and change only one and look at the uh, change in the model. Then you change another parameter, look at change in the model. In this way, you can calculate sensitivity of the model to each change in the parameter. Same for inputs. You change an input a bit, calculate model output, Look at the change delta y, divide by change in the input, and you see the uh, relative change to each input if you have several inputs. Very simple. So local sensitivity analysis, quite simple. Now, what is global sensitivity analysis? Well, uh, it's very close to uncertainty analysis now. Assumption is that we don't want to stay with optimal vector red one. We want to look at different vectors of parameters around in the certain uh, feasibility range for parameters. And for each of these points, non-optimal, we calculate change in the model output. It's very similar to uncertainty analysis now, because we sample values of parameters of, uh, in the parameter space, and for each of them we calculate model output. And then we look at change in the model output across the whole sample, and we judge about uncertainty of the model, or sensitivity of the model, rather, across the whole range of possible changes and parameters. Not only small change around the optimal one. That would be global uh, uh, sensitivity analysis. And there are different ways to approach it. So check this review papers and uh, read the books of Saltelli, for example, where it's all presented in uh, detail. See, this is global, okay? So we sample. We do the same for every point, and then somehow we integrate this. Integration of this uh, information is different in different methods, but leads to more or less uh, similar results. For example, method of Morris is widely used where indeed we consider endpoints, do local sensitivity for all of them, and integrate results. Okay, for example, by averaging or using other means. Any questions about sensitivity analysis? Quite simple. So every modeling study should have, I think, sensitivity analysis, at least local sensitivity analysis, which is very easy to do. You just arrange a loop across all parameters, change them a bit, and see the model output, and that's your sensitivity analysis. Analysis, eh? Not necessarily, function could be anything, because we calculate model output at each point. Continuous or not, we don't care. So that means the general um, approach, okay. Uh, in, general. in general. If you assume continuous function, yes, you can, see, uh, you can look at how fast it changes if you move away, yes, indeed. You can do a bit more sophisticated analysis, 
Uh, and actually, model outputs are continuous. If you slightly change one parameter, you wouldn't have abrupt changes. It, typically, it's quite smooth change. In natural processes, many changes are smooth, at least in certain period of time and uh, region. Yeah, you're right. We can do a bit more yeah. for that. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Originalized sensitivity analysis. Uh, well, uh, Hornberger and Speer in '81, and then Wegener updated this method uh, in uh, 2001 when he was actually, I think, postdoc in Delft at that time. I think it had happened. Anyway, uh, but he's now professor uh, in Bristol, uh, still doing a lot in uh, sensitivity and uncertainty analysis. So. Uh, a good recommendation would be to check his papers with co-authors uh, writing about sensitivity analysis. So idea here is this. We sample n vectors of fa So factor here is either parameter or input. So in sensitivity analysis uh, literature, all of it is merged into the name factor, but fine. So factor is either parameter or input. So we sample n vectors, uh, n vectors of factors, and run the model for each of them. Then we compute model error for each run. And then we separate models into good or bad. It means Nash Sutcliffe high, Nash Sutcliffe low. Okay? So we, we make two uh, uh, subsets of this model. And then we plot empirical CDF of the good models against bad models. And if difference is high, well, for example, then we could use Kolmogorov-Smirnov statistics, which uh, Kolmogorov-Smirnov suggests that if you want to measure distance between two distributions, you should look at maximum difference between these two distributions. It's a Kolmogorov-Smirnov measure. But you can use other measures to compare two distributions. So if these CDFs are close, it means distribution of outputs or error of good models and bad models, more or less the same, as then uh, model outputs are not sensitive to the changes in parameters. If, however, there is a big difference, it means sensitivity is high and good models are considerably different from bad models. That's the principle of regionalized sensitivity analysis. Okay, also can be used. So, and uh, Wagener suggested an update for this and later also similar update with in the papers of Pianozzi. You can do for many, yes. Uh, you can have vectors of factors, uh, joint distribution, so uh, not joint, so you can do different things. But if you want to look at one, then you fix all parameters at optimal values, and then you have more detailed analysis because you look at only one parameter. That's right, yes. Yes? I got a question. If I want to publish the results of my model, should I press in the results of the sensitivity analysis, or it doesn't matter for the paper? Well, look, it's an interesting question, of course. It depends on the reviewers. But I think, uh, well, my principle is to try to do as much as possible in following the traditional modeling uh, framework. So modeling theory says you should analyze sensitivity of uh, parameters or inputs and uh, their influence on the output. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it, it would be good you justify it. Okay. Like, we didn't have resources, we didn't have money, or it's obvious. But since you, but some reviewers uh, may say, well, look, you are not full, your modeling study is not full, so please add sensitivity analysis. And also it's not too difficult. Mm -hmm. But you are right, many papers don't do it, simply. Mm -hmm. They just don't do it, publish modeling results, not looking at sensitivity, also happening, and still they're published, so. But better to do it. Mm -hmm. And uncertainty analysis, also nice to have, uh, as well. Now, what's the difference between sensitivity and uncertainty analysis? Is factor prioritization mainly. So what do you do? So you look at separate sensitivity analysis for every parameter, and then you put on top rank the one which influences the model output most. <laughs> and then second one, third one, and so on. So par parameters which do not influence much model output, maybe you shouldn't invest time in uh, trying to uh, make better refined evaluation of these parameters because it wouldn't matter anyway. 
So your uh, thinking should go to the parameters which influence output considerably, and then try to fix them better, because obviously if you're wrong with this parameter, your model output changes a lot. That's the role of sensitivity analysis. Main role is to find parameters or inputs which influences influence model output considerably. That's sensitivity. That's why we do sensitivity analysis. So a recommendation then for future researchers would be, or for yourself also, would be to invest uh, money and time into measuring maybe these parameters better or finding more information about these parameters or inputs. Okay. No, we started with, if you remember, we started with red point here, which is calibrated parameters. You remember that? And local sensitivity analysis is only around this point. So sensitivity comes after calibration. However, interestingly, in SWOT, uh, sensitivity is done before calibration. I think it's methodologically wrong. Or at least you should explain to the users that it's iterative procedure. So why they do it? Because SWOT has so many parameters. To calibrate all of them takes a lot of time and effort and uh, difficult. So what they do for these complex models, not they, but in general researchers for complex models, first you assume some uh, red point somewhere before calibration, assume. Then you do sensitivity analysis and determine parameters that influence the output or error and do calibration only for them. It saves time because your uh, search space is much smaller. Instead of 50 parameters, you calibrate only five. However, after you do calibration, you should return back to sensitivity and do real sensitivity because what you did before was maybe in the uh, region of, maybe it was somewhere here. But after calibration, your model would be here. So please do sensitivity here again, or even iteratively. So that's uh, what you should uh, take into account, especially when you work with SWOT, where s uh, standard uh, procedure is to first do sensitivity, then calibration. But I would say yes, but again, do sensitivity after you calibrated the model. OK? Fine. So that's introduction to sensitivity analysis. I think we are more or less done. There are other methods. So how much time we have? So we have some time. So now, what we did so far <coughs> is to analyze sensitivity of the model on historical data. How valuable it is. Yes, it's valuable. Uh, and sensitivity and uncertainty on historical data. It's valuable, but uh, please understand that model would be run in, in the future. So imagine you analyze sensitivity for each time step. Uncertainty, sorry, for each time step. And then model runs next time step. Question is, what is its uncertainty for the next run? Do you know it? Strangely, this question is hardly discussed in the literature. So how to assess properties of the model in the future? What we did for the past, yes, but what about the future? So we uh, developed a technology uh, at IHE uh, using methods of computational intelligence or machine learning to build machine learning models of uncertainty of models. And there are two methods developed. One is called unique. Another one is called MLU, machine learning for uncertainty estimation. And unique is, uh, OK, I'll tell you in a second. OK, so this data-driven model, you know all this. So we skip this. And this discussion, let's start first. Forget about uncertainty for a second. And let's look at the model first. So the model is this. Uh, don't look at this part here on the right. Don't look at this. Let's look at the model. So it has input. It comes here. There is model output. And this model output you use uh, and you're happy. 
But model has an error. How do you know what value of the error? You need historical data, observed output. So for the past data, the model would generate model output. You compare it to the observed output. You calculate error for each time step. Okay? And uh, you stop there. What we did, we built error character now. First step. So error character would forecast the error based on the past data. So why do we think we can forecast the error? Because, well, if we can forecast output, we think we could also forecast error. So this is statistical model or neural network model that would be trained on the historical data about errors. This would be output. And input would be the same inputs that I used for the model, plus perhaps model states. Look, there is one input coming from model state, and this is soil moisture, which for the past can be calculated at each time step. And also for the future, because for the future we also run the model, and we can read the input internal input variable and use it as input to uh, this data-driven model. Is this clear? Now, for new model runs, we feed the input vector, we calculate model output, Observation we don't have, so we cannot calculate error, maybe. If not, then we don't use this input. But if we have an observation, we also can feed it in. But typically, we don't. And if not, we use other inputs, and we generate forecast error. And we subtract this error from model output, and we have improved output. That's the main principle of error correcting scheme. In meteorology, it's called bias corrector, but in uh, I think better name is error correcting because error is not fixed. It changes from time step to time step. And bias is something fixed. Any questions here? Strangely, it's not done. It's not difficult to do. You can add this error corrector to any of your hydrological models, training neural network to forecast errors. And we do it for many studies nowadays in our uh, master work and PhD work. Next step is why don't we, instead of predicting error, we would forecast the PDF of the error. So we forecast probabilistic properties of that error. And this is what we did in our unique method published in Water Resource Research and in other journals, because we had several variants of this with our PhD student, Durgal al -Sharesta. Okay. So instead of uh, predicting error, we predict properties of PDF. And then, since we can predict PDF or its properties, then the model, deterministic model, would give you deterministic model output. And this model, U, would give you forecasted quantiles around that output. Or PDF, if it gives you 10 quantiles, we can make a neural network with 10 outputs. And it will give you here the PDF of uh, the output. So, And then what we have is deterministic output plus its uncertainty estimates. Predictive model of uncertainty. So if we look at hydroinformatics, so to say, approach to modeling, we first build models of systems, M of S. Then we could build models of models. So surrogate models of complex models, we build simplified models. Also, we could build models of uncertainty of a model, U. And also, we could optimize model structures uh, and um, in this way, we would have optimal model plus model of its uncertainty. That's, I think, approach to have in mind. Maybe you will not do it always, but it's good to have it in mind that it's possible. And there is software to do it, so you can do it. So let's look at unique method. How to build a model of uncertainty. So slide 86. What we do is this. First, 
Idea is simple. Let's look at model output, calculate error for all historical period, and uh, have the data set which has error for all past examples. And then we do this. We simply find CDF of this error across the whole time period. And then we could calculate two quantiles, lower interval, upper interval, these two 5%, 95% quantile. And this would give you the range of uncertainty of that model across the whole period of simulation. It's averaged value of uncertainty, isn't it? It's simply PDF of the error. Yes, it's CDF, but it, we don't know it. So it's drawn, but we don't know it. So we have only empirical distribution. It's curved, but maybe not very smooth like here. Empirical distribution. And then we have prediction interval. Very simple. So when a model, deterministic model generates your output, we say, yes, it's deterministic. Plus, we have this prediction interval, which is the same for every model output. It's averaged across. It's average estimation of uncertainty of the model across long, long simulation time. That's first idea. Second idea, to develop this further, is to cluster the data about errors, information about errors. So consider we have now two parameters rainfall RT minus 2 and flow QT minus 1, for example. And for each of the, in this space of uh, variables, we calculate error for each model run. So number of time steps here is equal to number of examples. What we do then? We then cluster this data into three blocks, and we calculate CDF for each of these blocks separately. Like this. We would have three different CDFs. This one for low flows, and this one for high flows, and this one, say, for intermediate flows. Okay? We're already a bit more accurate. So if model generates low flow, we say this is deterministic output, and we will take estimates of uncertainty from here. And if it's high flow, we take an estimate of uncertainty from here, and so on. That's second idea. The third idea is to use fuzzy clustering and to make an overall model of everything. Fuzzy clustering says that data belongs to a cluster with a certain membership. So, for example, this point belongs to this cluster with a membership of 0, 9 and with a membership of 0, 1 to this and 0, 1 to this. And data here belongs to this cluster with a membership of maybe 0, 5 and 0, 3 here and 0, 2 here. In this way, we can build one single matrix for the whole data set, but the quantile, which is written here, this is 5% uh, quantile, is multiplied by the membership of belonging of this example to cluster uh, class here. So in this way, for every example, we can calculate 5% quantile. And then we build neural network for 5% quantile, low quantile, and upper quantile. Prediction interval upper, prediction interval low. And then if new data comes in, we run these two neural networks, and we calculate two quantiles for a single example, for a single new model run. That's the principle of unique. I know it sounds a bit uh, cumbersome, and difficult. So if you want to know more, read the paper. It's all described in detail. What I want to tell you simply, we managed to train machine learning model, neural network in this case, that predicts two quantiles for each new model run. So it means we can predict uh, uncertainty of the model for every future model run. I think it's important achievement, actually. We were quite proud when we managed to do it, and we could demonstrate that it works on different examples. So check the literature. You will see how it works. So recently, with our 
student, MSc student, Omar Vani, who is now doing PhD in Switzerland, actually he defended already, we developed a method which is simplified version of unique, which uses instance-based learning. Uh, you remember instance-based learning? Uh, nearest neighbor method. So it's simpler than unique and, and shows similar results. So check the paper in uh, HESS of 2018. So Vani, Solomatin, and somebody else. So this is a predictive model of residual uncertainty. Look, we don't have any Monte Carlo here. Uncertainty is manifested by the model error only. No Monte Carlo. So this is residual uncertainty. So let me skip through details of unique. Not too many. And now let's talk about last method for this lecture is called MLU, machine learning for uncertain estimation. What we do here, we now return back to Monte Carlo, we run full Monte Carlo analysis on the past, and then we train neural network to reproduce the results of Monte Carlo for the future. Because we have data on the past, let's use this data for the future. That's principle in MLU. So we run standard Monte Carlo now. So we, we take the optimal model as in unique, so calibrated model, and then we arrange. Huh, this is not seen by others. So and then we, it, this is optimal value 160, and then we arrange sampling around the optimal value here, okay, by using these distributions. In this way, we get the spaghetti. Let's write it down all in a huge matrices in computer memory. And what we do next? We want to assess parametric uncertainty of the model N for T plus one. When the new input vector is fed into the model. Next time step. We don't have it yet. Because all we had in Monte Carlo is about the past. So the idea is to encapsulate that knowledge about the past, about uncertainty of the model in the past, into fast neural network, and run it along with normal deterministic model and estimate quantiles of the distribution of the model output for that new time step. So that's an idea, encapsulate the results <coughs> of Monte Carlo simulation, the machine learning model. <coughs> That's what we did. I'll not go into details. This is an example, brew catchment in UK. Very highly studied catchment, is experimental catchment, so there is a lot of data, very accurate data, about rainfall and flows and everything else. Used widely in different hydrological studies because it's very well uh, studied. So what we did, we built a conceptual model of this catchment. This is data, rainfall, and runoff, as you can see, so increase in rainfall leads to increase in flow here, you see. There's clear relationship between rainfall and runoff. So we used this for calibration and this for validation or testing, S split the data. We used HBV model for this, similar to tank model, a bit more sophisticated. So, um, okay, I'll skip average mutual information analysis and Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo, we did sampling nine parameters of HBV uniformly from feasible ranges. So in this way, we build up the Monte Carlo framework. We run it for 10,000 times because it stopped stabilized, all means uh, stabilized. But in total, we did 75,000 runs, but we used results only of 10,000 runs. Uh, we, sorry, we stopped after 10,000 runs. Okay. So our machine learning model to predict U uncertainty, so the quantiles used effective rainfall five time steps back, hours, previous flow at the previous time step, and change in the flow. Remember we discussed change in the flow is better to use than flow itself. And this a five-time step back actually was an average of 
several rainfalls in the past. So it's sort of moving average. Why? Because it allowed us to remove the noise. It smoothened the run, uh, rainfall. So we use them five model trees, locally weighted regression, and uh, multi-layer perceptron neural network to build this predictive model of uncertainty. Okay, let me show you the results. So if we zoom in, now this is output of deterministic model in the middle, and what you see here is a uh, gray plot shows you interval 90% probability estimate uh, of the interval for each time stop. So it makes it gray line going around the uh, model output. Interestingly, look, sometimes model output is outside of 90% interval. So it's a bit strange, isn't it? So why is that? Typically it should be in it, inside, and this interval should be around the model output more or less, right? Well, it happens because blue line is generated by HBV model, but gray interval is generated by a model which has no knowledge of HBV, which is neural network model. And that's a bit of a problem for this method and for many other methods, similar methods. Well, there are no ma many similar methods. Actually, this method uh, that uh, the neural network model works separately from HBV. So idea is, huh? okay, but in most cases it generates outputs, so in fact neural networks takes a bit on itself to predict the flow. So we're comparing in fact here HBV with the neural network that predicts of course interval, but in a way it predicts the flow. So you can say it's a bit of hybrid model. If you, we somehow, we didn't do it, but for you maybe a good idea to think of in the future research, how to merge these two models, indeed to make it one single hybrid model. So we didn't do it, but it's something to have in mind. But overall, anyway, this shows you a bit of, you know, it's encapsulation of Monte Carlo uncertainty in the, in the uh, prediction intervals. Extension, just a second, extension here is, is that we generate not two uh, quantiles, but 10. When we generate 10, we train 10 neural networks, each for a different quantile, and in this way we can approximate CDF here quite accurately. And it means for every time step, we have CDF or PDF of uncertainty. So for new time step, not only two quantiles, not only interval, but also we can draw CDF like we did here. Yes, questions? Well, uh, about time, <laughs> it's a time question, but uh, <coughs> time to reflect about our <coughs> changing conditions in, in South America. Uh, one question I have. Uh, mostly the papers of in uncertainty and also the discussion, uh, in my opinion, are very valuable, very profitable. But one question is, uh, what is the fraction of this uncertainty, again, in terms of the overall short-term water balance during a thunderstorm, of during, during a rainfall, I think. So uh, uh, my question is, the fraction of uncertainty we have in one part of the hydrograph what is the representation of this uncertainty in the overall water balance through the transfer? So that is because uh, we are uh, looking for one shot of one component. That is runoff, run the very important component, especially in the streams. Huh? But at all, what is the representation of this uncertainty in the water balance during the rainfall? Uh, that's, that's my one question. The second is in, in related to time. It is expected that during time, the neural, neural network is being trained and be learned and is going to reduce the uncertainty in time. Uh, that's, so my question is, 
is this the case or not? Because sometimes you are making the uncertainty, but one time for the other, you have not an update in knowledge about reducing uncertainty. Yes. So that's the two questions. OK, thank you. Good questions. So first question, what's the proportion of uncertainty in this? Well, I don't know. Uh, this plot show how much uncertainty you have. And it's on peaks, it's considerable. Why? Simply because model has high error on peaks. On low values, it has lower value, low uncertainty here, if you look. However, strangely, here you have a peak. Why? I'm not sure why. It's unclear for me. But on peaks, you have indeed high uncertainty, which is just uh, understandable. High error of the model, high uncertainty. That's how it is. Uh, in terms of water balance, of course, if you assume 95% probability, which is very high value, uh, so your water balance uh, breaks, uh, but it breaks with respect to optimal model, deterministic model. But when you assume uncertainty, so it means this uncertainty was brought by uh, strange values of, or strange combination of parameters. And if that model with the strange combination of parameters is correct, then water balance is not broken. And we don't know what is true. That's why we say parameters are uncertain. So we don't know exactly, uh, we don't know if calibrated values of parameters are good. If we know they're really good, we wouldn't do uncertainty analysis. We'd use deterministic model. So that's... Right, yes. Yeah. Okay, but uh, can I answer this first still? If Because what we did here is parametric uncertainty. So if you mean rainfall, then the situation is a bit different. So, for example, this gray peak. Okay, if we go back to see better peak. So, for example, this value here, gray on top. Uh, why it is here? Because sampled rainfall, if we assume rainfall uncertainty, sampled rainfall was high. That's why model output is high. That's it. Uh, but probability of rainfall to be that high is low. So it's only 5%. So And probability of this point is also only 5%. Because this is the range. So behind it, there is a distribution. Maybe it's better to look at distribution than in intervals, because intervals are misleading in a way. They show gray uh, interval, but in fact, every point in this gray has the same color, but very different probability. So in the middle, probability is high, of course, here, around deterministic value, but at the edges, it's low. So that's what it is. And second question was, again, about... Uncertainty yeah, yeah. should be reduced in time because yeah, the, yeah. the okay. model is being uh, yes. le is learned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So what is done here is this: that we use, say, five years of data to train neural network, yeah. and then what you see here in testing, we don't change neural network, so it's doing nothing uh, to learn more. But uncertainty would not be reduced here. It cannot be reduced because we do nothing about reduction of uncertainty. We simply predicting the uncertainty based on the past information. So we cannot reduce it. What we can do, however, with every period of time, like with every season, we could retrain neural network to take into account new data. And then it would become sort of more accurate because it takes into account latest information. So that we can do. Additionally, yes. Also, okay, climate change. So maybe we could we assume stationarity, of course, here. So the, during the model run, it's all the same. But okay, climate change, global change, of course, have influence. So you have to take into account. If you know the trend, you add the trend simply, and then you can account for some changes which you assume have happened. Right. So what we did here, we considered the main principles uncertainty of models. We uh, 
introduced the uh, the probabilistic model of uncertainty. So we assume probabilistic uncertainty in parameters, for example, or inputs, and then we say uncertainty propagates through the model to uncertainty of the output. How to propagate? If model is non-linear model uh, represented as software, it's not analytically expressed. So we cannot use this linearization methods or other methods. We should use Monte Carlo framework. Monte Carlo framework is simple. We simply say we would run the same deterministic model many times for different values of uh, parameters, which were sampled from some distributions. These distributions are inaccurate. So your uncertainty analysis in general is inaccurate, unfortunately, because we depend on knowledge of this distribution. There was a good question from Parana that uh, uh, indeed we depend on uh, distribution. So yeah, we do. That's Monte Carlo framework. Then we said, OK, let's look also at the following. So we can analyze uh, the uncertainty of the model based on past data. That's fine. But what to do for the future model runs? And this is novel element in our research that we're building predictive model of uncertainty and not the model of uncertainty of the past, which was done a million times. So in this research, which we did last 10 years, we developed two methods. So one method looks at residual uncertainty, so no Monte Carlo. We assume ideal model, however, still an error, and error is manifestation of uncertainty. And we still can build neural network model that predicts uncertainty of that model for future model runs. That's unique method. And second method, we use Monte Carlo framework. We generate enough data to train our machine learning model that would predict the, uh, sorry, I want to go back to predictive models of uncertainty because it's nice to reflect on this figure. So we then develop model U that predict uncertainty of the deterministic model output. And then we, dis, uh, uh, then we give deterministic model output plus probabilistic estimates of the uncertainty. That's, I think, uh, sort of uh, a framework that we try to use in all our modeling studies. It could be a simplified way of uh, looking at uncertainty, simply, purely, analyzing it for the past, but if you want to do more, we could predict it for the future. Okay, so that's summary of what we did with uncertainty here. And they gave you publications to look at, and there is a lot of literature also to add. Let me see how we end up. And with this, I thank you for your attention on the uncertainty part, because we still have one hour, right? Oh, really? I don't know why you just sec, just sec. Before 200 questions, I would like to uh, ask you. We agreed last time, uh, well, uh, there were requests to do uncertainty, so that's what I did. It was not really planned, but I think it's an important element, which is a bit novel. Uh, thank you. Uh, second, uh, you asked to uh, show how to use GLOBE for real thing. It would take me 10 minutes maybe to show I can do it on an example, simple example, so that you know how to incorporate your external models into GLOBE to do optimization. Um, and uh, the third thing which we didn't do, we didn't uh, put all our results of neural network modeling into the Excel sheet. But perhaps you can do it yourself. I showed you uh, the scatter plot, and there was homework for yesterday. To you have all the detailed explanation of all the steps how to do it. You extract data from out files we generated, put it in Excel, and plot nice plots. And they were presented actually on the in the presentation. But you can do it yourself. Please do it, and it would finalize your neural network exercise and comparison of. Uh, simple linear regression model to neural network model, which would show you that neural network is, in fact, more accurate. And please do it for QT plus 3 for and QT plus 6, because then accuracy is lower, and then you have many less, uh, smaller number of parameters, and uh, it's nice to do. So shall I show you GLOBE quickly? 
Yes? Or you want to pose questions? We could discuss questions. More related to the follow-up, that is the, the, the days after the course, so uh -huh. taking that strategy, because of course, one, one point is the, 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 the presentation, the, 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 the formal situation of the course, but I think we have a very good uh, uh, exercise, assignments of homework. And second, uh, several uh, brainstorm ideas of how can we enhance our running, running research all of here, mm -hmm. but also people not attending today because uh, mostly of them are in, in field today, uh, making field analysis, field work, mm -hmm. several, right. perhaps half of the, of the, of the class. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, of course, not trying to become, a, 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 say, a, a formal uh, supervision, but I think that if we have not enough time to finalize these assignments today, we can make a, a short agenda of uh, uh, following with some exercise uh, in the next weeks or something like that, mm -hmm. because some of the people here are still selecting the final project, uh -huh. and they can uh, adapt flexibly uh, new component, new uh, schedules in their flow charts. Right. So several, perhaps more of them. Uh, so even people not attending today. So uh, this is not an agenda, a formal agenda, but could be uh, a, perhaps an, an opportunity to follow up with new projects uh, of interest to, to also to your institute and to your group. Uh, and of course, we can make this follow up through email, uh, through uh, your mm -hmm. uh, uh, consents. Uh, this mm -hmm. is, this is my, this is not only a reflection and a strategic reflection, because I think the, the, we have not enough time to, to do that uh, in terms of feedbacking or even uh, showing up. So, so only one uh, uh, warning and uh, an invitation at the same time. Uh, what's your opinion about that? Okay? Sure, yes. Okay. So perhaps you got some knowledge of new things and you may think rethink what you do in MSc and it's not rethinking really everything but adding new components like uncertainty analysis maybe what? to describe your modeling process in a bit bit structured more structured way right maybe thinking of also other models to use except yours and uh, that's what i wanted to talk about the how to prepare a paper and deal with reviewers also and also a comment from people from the cp the same AI, the center we we met in last mm -hmm. uh, yeah. day. Uh, we are expecting a new round of conversation next week with several researchers about how can we introduce new algorithms in the, in the new supercomputer. So the, the, the moment is, is, is really important now that they are open more space for students to learn or to, to train their uh, uncertainty, uncertainty analysis in this supercomputer. So this is very new, uh, fresh news yes, that yes. Uh, arrived today in my, my email. So th for that reason, I think this we can uh, address the, 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 the initial exercise today. But I think this we, we can perform uh, uh, better um, follow-up in the next days. So that is my, my, inform my announcement from the center. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they are also expecting a very good uh, 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 projects coming from the students, uh, also with uh, the, the, the consent of Professor uh, Solomatina uh, uh, about uh, further partnerships uh, with the institute. So this is only the announcement. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So if you have supercomputers, you launch hundred computers, uh, one for each ensemble run in Monte Carlo, and you save your time hundred times. So that's easiest what you can do. Right. Okay, uh, Professor Mendionda, thank you. But what about, do we need a break or I could continue and uh, finish quicker? When do we have defense at 2 o'clock? I prepare, I am prepared for, for the defense. Is it in this building? Is it far? Okay, but we need lunch and all this, so... Okay, but uh, look, I promised to do something, so I would like to do it. Uh, so, uh, Globe.
go to globe, open it. No, before we go there, can you read this? Uh, uh, look in, uh, sorry, look into the folder uh, globe, please. Uh, globe executable to run, in my case it's called, but in your case it's called globe, I suppose. You have this list. Unfortunately, I cannot change font. Maybe I do, but I forgot how. Or maybe I do change font. Yeah, just a second. Display font. Yes, I can change font here to something like uh, 8. Right. Now we can see it maybe better. <coughs> so what we'll do now, we will run external program that generates, that takes the input called gpin. Uh, strangely, it's not here. Okay, globe would generate. So this is globe executable. Sorry, where? In Thames? Ah, in demos. Yes, that's right. Yes, okay. Uh, so it would take the uh, uh, the uh, file. Uh, sorry, it generates file gpin. This program six hump. You remember six hump? We uh, looked at this function. Its implementation here is in Pascal, and I'll show it to you. So this is your external program that you want to run to generate output grsp. So if you look into it by notepad, you would see this code. It's very simple code, and it implements uh, the function. This is the 6-up function. What it does, it opens the file gpin, reads two values from it, because it's two-dimensional optimization problem. It checks if it's in the bounds boundaries. If it is not, then it returns very high value, which is bad value, because we're minimizing. So this is 10 million value. But if it's in the bounds, it generates, uh, calculates output, and it writes it to file grsp. Very simple. Okay, now, if you are running your uh, calibration problem, you will in your code of the model you will have to write small piece that reads parameters from GPIN. In our case, it was eight parameters here. You will read them. Then you run your model here, your code to run the model here. Model generates output. You calculate error of that model if you're calibrating it, and you write error into this file grsp. That's it. So you have to write these codes, of course, because you, if you write the mod, you have to write codes. That's how you uh, do it. Actually, I could give you code already written in Pascal for tank model, if you want. So it's also external code. I have it. We can do it. But I deliberately have chosen to show you a very simple function so that you see what's happening because it's on one page, on one screen, I mean. And this is this uh, Hosaki function, which, uh, well, I showed you it many times already, I, I hope. Just a second. Oh, sorry, it's a wrong presentation. Anyway, do you need uh, to see it on the fold on the on the uh, slide or not? This function. Oh, you trust me, I implemented it correctly. Uh, thank you for your trust. But I don't trust myself, so I will. Uh, presentation. Where is optimization presentation? Let's see, go here. Uh, 
Right. So. So it's this function. Look, we implemented this function there. So if you look at the code, you will see it's this function implemented in in the code of uh, this. So it's this one. You see, exponent or not? Where is the exponent? No, it's a different function. Oh, it's six hump. No, it's a different one. You see, you trust me, and I was right not to trust myself. So it's a different function. Sorry for that. It's six hump function. So it's a function with six minima. That's why it's called six hump. So it's a different function. Anyway, this is how you calculate the output of your model in this case. So what we do now is this. We start globe. Yes, of course. So I assume this is equation for the error of the model. Y is output. So first you run the model, and then you calculate error using root mean squared error, whatever. And you write that error, because when you calibrate, you write the error. You want to minimize error. You write it to GRSP. You remember the diagram. GRSP is output file, response. So this is a, a file with GPIN, means parameters input. And this is response. So now we start globe. And we start new project. Ah, we have a project, sorry. So let me open existing project, excuse me. And it's called Six Hump. In demos, there is a project called Six Hump. In demos. Do, do you have this demos folder? Do you have it? Okay. Now, go to set parameters, and I'll show you what is happening here. So set parameters, it says we will be using now external program. You see this? I already prepared file for you. And external program to run would be called sixum.executable. It's compiled Pascal code, which you have just seen. It's a compiled, this code I compiled, and it became executable. So that when you run it, it has to read GPIN file and write GRSP. Nothing else. It doesn't show anything on screen. You don't see it running, actually, because it's in the background. But it does important job reading GPIN every time and writing GRSP. That's what's happening. Window hidden, by the way. You can show the window, but it shows nothing. So not, uh, what you will see is black window jumping at you. So maybe we can do it, but I'm afraid to crash windows with, with this. So that's uh, how we uh, um, set up the model. And now, OK, let's run only one algorithm, not to uh, say genetic algorithm, for example. OK, uncheck all the algorithms here, just to run only one so that you see what's happening. Oops, sorry, I should have pressed. Uh, OK. And we start optimization. And why it is so slow now? You remember how fast it was? Are you running it? You see, this is evaluation of uh, the different model runs. Because every time now it goes to disk, takes the model to run, writes file, and goes back. And it's slow. But it's going on. So you see it, eighth generation of genetic algorithm, generation nine, you see generation of outputs. And every time you see the, uh, you, you run the model. <coughs> Generation 15, I hope it will stop soon. 17, 19, how long will it run, I don't know. But, oh, stopped. After 23 generations, we reach the point when model error is, uh, sorry, uh, the function value is low. And this is the function value that you find, 4.71, after 768 gener uh, runs. So we have run now external program for 700 runs.
So this is how you uh, run uh, external program. Okay, let me show you what is in the code for tank model now. Well, any questions here? No, more or less clear? So you specify file name uh, to run. And by the way, I forgot to tell you, sorry, you also have to specify this file here, var. Why? Because these are ranges for each parameter, and we search in this hypercube, which is uh, fixed by these ranges for each parameter. So there are, in, in this case, there are two lines, left-hand side, right-hand side, left-hand side, right-hand side, ranges for the parameters, and these are these values, actually. So what you also could do, you could specify your model, uh, cert model, here. So as I said, it's safer to close globe because the, uh, there was a don't save on disk, okay, because you can reproduce it yourself. Uh, sorry, at, at a short notice, I cannot find now my model, just a moment. So. Uh, this is the Pascal code for the uh, tank model. So if we look into it, uh, you will see that, well, this model does the same. It first reads eight parameters from the gpin file. <coughs> then it assigns uh, values from this vector, which it read from the file to this variable. So you remember D1, K1, 2, 3, 4, S1, S2. Then this is the model to calculate in one model run. That's the code of the model. You remember Q1 is uh, Q2, Q3, and so on. All this is calculated here, very simple. And then we calculate error. So model output is in uh, TA array for n time steps. See this? So then we calculate error, for example, here coefficient of efficiency, Nash Sutcliffe. This is how Nash Sutcliffe is calculated. And the result, we return as the tank model result. And, okay, I'll sh not show you code. I we write it into GRSP file. Same thing as for Hosaki. So I could zip all this, we'll send it to you. You could analyze this code. If you have simple uh, Delphi uh, compiler, you can uh, compile it and uh, play with it if you want. But I need to prepare to clean up the mess here because it's a bit messy code. It was written some time ago, 12 years ago, last change. But this tank X model is model with the interface, but the code it uses is the, the one I showed you to calculate. And there is another model which is called uh, tank Sorry. Tank executable. And this model, if you run it, it says this app cannot run on your PC. Wow. It's so old that it cannot run on the Windows 10. That's a surprise to me. It should be able to run. Anyway, so but I will show you how to run it. <coughs> so it is a command line. You know what is command line? Yes, good. Some of you maybe. So you run model tank exe, and you specify that calibration would come from file S6, that gpin would be gpin S6 pin, and output would go to ASCII file, and slash g means show graphics, or don't show graphics. Ah, now I know. So this model is with graphics. I will send you pure code that runs simply on command line, reads gpin, generates grsp. That's it. You will not need anything else. Okay. Well, globe would run it on command line, but if you want, you can run it here in, in the command line here. You can uh, start CMD, of course, yes. Uh, so you start CMD, command prompt, you go to the folder where you need, and you, ta and you say, uh, uh, tank uh, C, it's called tank C, uh, command line, tank C, 
space, ta -ta 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 -ta, and there is a batch file that would do it for you. So I, I will send you, I have to prepare files nicely, we'll send you to do. Any questions about this? No. So that's how you uh, use uh, Globe to run any model you like. But again, I want you, uh, Globe has some bugs, so especially in file management. When you want to create these projects, it was nicely working on the Windows 98, but then unfortunately some function call changed and it doesn't save well this project, or it tries to write it to folder program files, which is closed for writing nowadays. So you have to open for writing, but it doesn't often help, uh, happens, unfortunately. Windows 10 is very strict on uh, writing to system folders. And some of the information it keeps in system folder uh, under program files when you install it. That's why you gave, I gave you folder with Globe because there is also installation file. You install Globe and you run it from, com, uh, from uh, start button. But uh, there are problems with this. Anyway, that was one. Second, what was that we agreed to do? How to write papers? They want to write papers? Uh, fine. So then. Let me find this presentation. Uh huh. Good, good. Okay, let's do it. Yes. Of course. So uh, I have sent you, I think, the file called "How to Prepare a Paper and Deal with Reviewers." You have it. This presentation is based on that material, so I will send it to you as well, but you could simply follow it now and then you will look at it in presentation form, which is much shorter, of course. I cannot discuss all the details. So how to prepare a paper and deal with reviewers. Look, it's my, again, it's my own judgment how to do it. You can do it the way you like. You can listen to your professors and they will tell you maybe different things. Uh, so please uh, see it as a, a judgmental uh, statement uh, about how to do it. It can be done different ways. So first, try to answer the following questions. What is your motivation to carry out this research? Why? And main motivation should be that uh, previous research was not enough. Never say there was no research. It's not true. But you should find the gaps, knowledge gaps. It means the areas which were not covered by previous researchers. So you give them praise. They did a lot. But certain things they themselves already in their papers, they have said in the conclusions, outlook, what to do. And you can say, oh, that person said what to do. And we're doing this now, following advice of wise people. That's your motivation, because they told you to do it. And you may have your own ideas why to do it. Because mankind suffers from floods and all this stuff. So you could, of course, uh, formulate uh, why you do this. Second, what is new in this research with the, compared to other? That's the most difficult part. Because very often subjects, uh, topics given to you are more or less topics which were already attended by others. So you have to find the new component, novelty, innovation. Research journals don't accept papers without innovation. Simply people say we reject, send it to practical journal. If it's, if it's just model run for yet another case study, there is not much innovation. Third, what is your main message and conclusion? Three, four highlights. Currently journals ask you for highlights and it's very important to formulate them well because you, convince, you have to convince the editor that he or she would accept it and send to reviewers. If highlights are bad, he would say, no, not good paper, I even without reading it. So what is the main message and what you have achieved? That's the main message. Now, use experience of others. Read and analyze several highly cited papers, preferably written by people with Anglo-Saxon names. Sorry, it's no national preference. But uh, you would see uh, the good uh, English language, okay? Not always, but it's maybe a good thing. It doesn't mean it's a good paper, but it could mean they use good English. Second, ask colleagues to read and criticize your paper. Sometimes useful, but don't listen to uh, everything what they say because they may be wrong also. 
and present results at the seminar and listen to criticism. Be open for doing this. Now, what paper should include? Traditionally, this is traditional uh, table of contents, but look, maybe it would be different. Up to you. But reviewers typically conservative people, and uh, they uh, sort of follow more or less logical structure of a paper. First abstract. Abstract should have the same structure as the paper. Object, innovation, objective, so motivation, sorry, objectives, main methodology, main conclusions. And all in 10 lines. Not easy. Yeah. So try to do it. Sometimes you read abstract and it's not clear what they achieved. They describe uh, the problem 90% and then they say this paper presents a method to solve this problem. Okay, but okay, fine. And, and end of it, you know. So. so not good. Or they talk about methodology without posing the problem. They talk, oh, we use neural networks or we use this model, blah, blah, and why? Nobody knows. So second, introduction. Introduction should have main components. Motivation, as we said, why you are doing this. So motivation, again, is based on literature review, brief, because there would be another literature review, which is long. Uh, art of writing is to try to uh, split attention between small and big literature review. So motivation is always based on previous work. So this is motivation for you to solve certain societal problem, but also to say uh, why you're solving this and what others did. So if others did nothing, I don't trust it. Uh, typically, you don't write a paper on, in the empty field. There was always some work done. Find all these papers. What may happen, it gets to a reviewer who wrote something about this. That's why paper got to him, right? Editor knows these people. So he will send it to reviewers. And the reviewer would say, oh, I wrote a paper five years ago where I did similar things. Why didn't you cite me? And that reviewer would be right. So try to analyze literature in detail, also latest papers. Objectives. Objective, what I like is uh, there is one objective in one line or three lines, and then there is sub-objective, which would detail what you want to do. For example, objective of this paper is to analyze how efficient the new algorithm to solve uh, hydrodynamic uh, whatever is. Sub-objective, to analyze the uh, existing things, to analyze influence of a certain parameter, and to analyze efficiency based on supercomputers. These are sub-objectives. Research questions. Often, supervisor can tell you, formulate research questions, but often research questions would be repetition of these sub-objectives or specific objectives. So think yourself, what do you want? If specific objectives are clearly stated, these are, in fact, research questions. Or you don't specify specific objectives, you then specify research questions, it would be detailed account. Two ways are possible. Again, scientific innovation and practical value. Don't forget, what is the practical value of this paper? We all do applied science. It's not mathematics without any practical value. Please formulate what is innovation, what is practical value. Okay? Now, literature review. You review the literature, but for every paper you cite, so references in the end, citations in the middle, with the, say, I don't know, Smith, 2015, that citation. So every citation should mention what the person was solving problem, what was achieved, and what was not achieved. Analysis. And what is not achieved is the basis for your motivation, because people were studying this aspect, and they did know something, and that's for your motivation, isn't it? So please try to also say what they didn't achieve. But always praise the authors because they did hard work. Don't say, oh, it's all nonsense what they did. And I read 25 papers and nowhere this is covered. I don't trust it. So don't use these sentences. Nobody likes them. Also, don't try to praise yourself too much. You solve typically very small problem. You make very small step in discovering new knowledge. Say it. That is a small contribution. It's a contribution to 
you know, don't say new method of solving everything, you know, you know, so like Bavin writes papers, model of everything, you know, so okay, fine. Maybe he can build such models, we can't. Now, research methodology. Good to have a diagram which would have steps. First, second, third, and what feeds what. That's good to do. And actually, all the formulas you use should be in that part and not in the results. Often people just, in the results, they write results and they, oh, by the way, I forgot to put the formula. And they put in the results and discuss what it was. And then literature review comes out. So it's very messy paper sometimes. People don't know how to structure. This is the structure. It helps you to structure things. So results should have only results and discussion. Nothing about methods. All the methods should be described in methodology. Sometimes it's difficult to present a method without plots, which are based on results. Yes. So think of how to do it. Maybe uh, you refer from research methodology even to results forward to some figures. You can say, okay, we present this, and you can see results future. Or you uh, to present toy example here, so that would uh, uh, illustrate what you do here. Okay, think how to do it. Okay, case study, you know, you it's in hydrology or hydraulics, you present natural system, and you talk about case study. Don't forget, you submitted, if you submitted it to hydrological journal, then hydrologists would be reading it, and they love catchment, soil properties, temperature, pressure, whatever, so put it in physical characteristics of the system, not only method, so that's uh, good to do. Also, by the way, often uh, journals ask reproducibility of results, so it means if you use data sets, give the link where you get them, so that other people could take the same data and rerun your model and see if your results fit what you report. Not always possible, so if you cannot provide data, explain why, because it was part of the project, it was proprietary data, and you cannot make it public, but you have to say it. Okay, results and discussion. Some people present results, and then separate section on discussion. I don't like it. I think it's, uh, it's make your life more difficult. If you have several results, result discussion, result discussion. And what is discussion? What you see and what you interpret. If you see an outlier, you say, pay attention, there is an outlier. So why it is happening? Perhaps it's because of this, uh, but we don't know exactly. It needs further research or something like this. This is discussion, okay? Discussion sometimes is difficult to separate from dis discussions from conclusions, but you have to try to do it. So don't make, you can make some conclusions, but then you will have to repeat it briefly in the last uh, block, which is called conclusions. But some conclusions are already coming from discussion, so I think it's also good to, to say more than less in the discussion, because this is most important part of the paper, actually, to discuss the results. Because some papers you see, they present plots, plots, and then conclusions. And they don't discuss what you see. And authors sometimes don't think why this is different here and not different there, and so on, so on. It's something for, to discuss. <coughs> also, part of discussion is this, that you say, okay, this is what we get, and if re we recall literature review, where people were doing similar things, difference from previous work is A, B, C. And that shows that you're analyzing what others did, and you compare your results to what others did. <coughs> now, imagine you propose a new method. For sure, you have to compare new method to the old method. If you calculate something using new formula, you have to compare results to the previous uh, research. It means you have to implement methods of others. Not always possible, but try. Or if you use nonlinear uh, machine learning model, you have to start with linear model, always. You cannot say, oh, these are results of neural network. They're good, we're happy. No, you should say, we tried first naive model, then we tried linear regression model, and they don't work. We tried ARIMA model, doesn't work well, and that's why we move to non-linear models, more complex models, whatever they are, and this is the results of the application. Uh, reviewers may say, okay, you use neural network, why didn't you use support vector machines or whatever? You have to explain why. 
lack of resources, uh, or you give recommendation to try it for others, you have to say something, why you didn't do it. Or you say, we cannot do everything, or we used judgment of other authors that recommended this method. But in any case, even if somebody recommends neural network is the best, you have to say, we, we sort of know. I have to make intelligent face now, I'm photographed. <coughs> we, we have to uh, try different methods as well. But we'll do it in the next paper, something like this. You give outlook that indeed it's necessary. Then, okay, then you thought that it's... Sorry, somebody sent me a message, I have to read it, maybe. Okay, that's, uh, I will answer later. So, discussion, we discussed this. Now, conclusions and recommendations. Three parts. First, in these conclusions, you have to need, you have to say what you did. Like in every presentation. First, you, uh, every presentation, also paper, have five parts. First, a joke, to start with, to break the ice. Second, you will have to say what you will be talking about. One, two, three. Then you have to say it. That's main part. Then you have to summarize what you have just said. And last one is a joke. <laughs> Five parts. Paper may be, have three parts without jokes. Okay? So, conclusions. First summary, what you have just done. In this paper, we tra -ta -ta did this. Why is this important? Because some reviewers don't read the main part. Sorry. And you see it in the reviews, you know. So, help them to evaluate this paper well, put summary in the beginning of the conclusions. Then conclusions, what did we conclude in general? One, two, three, four. It's good to number, by the way, these. One, two, three, four, to structure conclusions. Not just chaotic, you know, talk about everything, jumping from one to another. One, two, three, four, that's it. And better to have three, everything. You know, three is nice, maybe from religious uh, connotations, but three is important. Now, <coughs> recommendations, <coughs> formulate recommendations. One thing is missing here, limitations. Very important thing. Some papers don't have them, they praise their own work. No limitations, universal method applicable everywhere. I don't trust it, no, sorry, it doesn't work like this. Limitation is this, <coughs> main limitation. This method was tested only one or two or three case studies and not more, that's one limitation. Second. We uh, explored standard uh, model, and you can use other types of models. Third, we use these values of parameters in algorithm, but you can use other, and it, it requires additional study. So often a recommendation is based on limitations. So you have limitations. Recommendation is to do what is limited. That's obvious. And outlook. Outlook is looking to the future. So it's a bit more philosophical recommendations. It's nice to, for example, well, we did machine learning model, but maybe we should now try hybrid models because others use physically based. We did machine learning and hybrid, something like this, a bit more philosophical into the future. And also societal relevance uh, or in impact on management practice because if you develop methods, uh, they not exist by themselves. They have to be used. So maybe this is part of recommendation, how managers could use this, uh, this type of thing. So it's good to show that you're thinking into the future and you have much bigger brain than only this narrow research. References. Well, ah, we have, yes, okay, references, clear reference, but let's move to other things. So plagiarism, you know what is plagiarism? Okay. Seven words taken from a paper in a row. Eight is already plagiarism, so don't do it. Style. Important. English, also important. What can I say? Improve English. Ask somebody who speaks English uh, to do it. Oh, good. Yes, excellent. But some translators that have no idea of this uh, research would change words uh, uh, hydrology into hydraulics and vice versa, all this style. Now, time, style. If you, I, I like papers written in present indefinite uh, tense. 
So we do this, we analyze this, we run the model and so on. Some people write in past indefinite tense. We ran the model, we saw on that figure. We did this, we did this, also fine. Some people write in present, uh, sorry, present perfect tense. We have done this, we have explored, also fine. But I like simple present indefinite tense. Also, some journals say you cannot say we did it or we see on that figure that. I like that it's colloquial, it simplifies uh, communication with the reader, why not? But some journals say no, you have to say it can be seen on the, on the figure or one can explore, one can observe, fine, uh, depends on you, that's a question of style. Don't write long sentences, break them up. Don't start sentences with and and but. Never, not allowed in English. Very often it's done. You say, say, and then, but, da, da, da. no. You can use however, or one can also judge, and so on. So, be, so read uh, books about style. Okay, there's enough also material in internet. You can find it, all this. Now, what reviewers to recommend? So, uh, many papers, quite many come, and all reviewers are from the same country and from the same city. So I doubt that there will be uh, objective uh, reviewers. Maybe they are friends or whatever. I don't know. But so very often, I, in this case, I send it back and say, look, guys, I mean, uh, give me geographical distribution of reviewers. And, and so on. That's one thing. Second thing, if you recommend a reviewer, it means you assume this reviewer is an expert in this field. Now, imagine you never cited this reviewer. So. So either you think he's not an expert, or you are stupid. So anyway, so if you recommend a reviewer, there might be citation to the work of this reviewer. Obviously for me, because if this reviewer is an expert, he must have written something about this topic, so you should cite this reviewer. And if you don't cite, then it means either it's an, an expert or whatever. So please think about this. So recommend reviewers whom you cite. Also, please be a psychologist. If you cite a reviewer and say, oh, it was all nonsense, and now you recommend this reviewer to review a paper, then, uh, you know, you increase chances that the reviewer would not be happy. But look, it's not a cynical s statement. It's a statement to say this, that other people also need the praise that they did a lot, because you cite typically good papers. So praise them, what they achieved, and say what was not done uh, in a polite manner. So that always helps. Right, checklist for, of good reviewers. <coughs> so reviewers, when they review a paper, you will be also reviewers, but put yourself into the shoes of that reviewer. So reviewers follow this checklist, uh, which is here or maybe even in front of them, and please do the same work instead of a reviewer before you send this paper to these reviewers, because they will use this checklist. First, is the purpose or goal of the work within the journal scope? Standard things. What are the problems to solve in the paper? Are they clearly stated? Are the techniques employed appropriate? Is the mathematics correct? And so on and so on. And this is what reviewers typically do. So do it yourself before you send it anywhere, right? Yes, by the way, have any parts of the paper already been published or considered for other publications? Often this is the case, why? Because people tend to present it at conferences, new results, and then to publish a paper. Be aware that currently uh, taking results in, from a conference paper, sorry, text from a conference paper, putting in a journal paper is not allowed. It's seen as plagiarism, it's all on the internet as you know, it's very easy to find. There is software to do it, global search, whatever. So what to do in this case? Well, go to the conference and present only part of the work, and then for the journal paper, you present all the results and with the proper discussion. Yes? Yes. Can we just uh, reuse the same results in our paper after the, after the presentation? Or we are assuming not to press the results in the conferences and just press the results in the paper? Up to you. There are different strategies. Of course, if you go to conference, you want to present something new, not old. 
But often people tend not to do it because they're afraid they present the results, somebody would see it and publish immediately, quickly, run, run. Uh, and so it's not nice to say it, but it's happening. In good tradi academic tradition, sorry to put in quotes, sometimes it's happening. So uh, many people, what they do, they first publish, then present at conferences. Of course, it's less interesting because publication was a year ago. But also what you can do, you present at conferences some results and in the paper extended results. So this is what you do. It's up to you. So it's not plagiarism? It's not plagiarism of yourself, no. but if you publish text in the conference paper, your journal paper should be different. Okay, okay. Otherwise, it's the same paper. Okay. Just conference papers. Well, if conference abstract, that's easy. Uh -huh. But conference paper often is six pages. Uh -huh. So it's half of your journal paper. You cannot just take text and copy it into journal paper. 20 years ago, maybe people did it, but nowadays it's, it's not allowed, it's not good. So strategically separate material between uh, conference paper and journal paper. And nobody in your CV counts uh, conference papers, as you know. It should be journal, peer-reviewed uh, journal. So publish main results in the journal, then it will be read. In a conference, you have 20 people in the room, and that's it. And they listen, they sleep, whatever, and then it's gone, you know. And nobody reads uh, conference proceedings, of course, afterwards. Rarely. Sorry, but that's the case. Yeah, so journal papers, yes. <coughs> One more thing. If you use figures in your papers, after publication, copyright belongs to the publisher. You cannot reu reuse your own figures, which you spend days to make. You cannot. It's not your property anymore. That's crazy, but this is the case. So what I invented, I invented the strategy. I'm sharing it with you. Before you send the paper to publication, make a web page, put all your graphical material in that web page, and give a reference to that web page in your paper. At the moment it's published on the internet, it becomes public property. Publishers cannot claim copyright on this uh, material. Easy. Before? Before. Of course, after it's too late. It's you sign copyright agreement that everything what you. Yeah, but uh, sorry, in this case, for instance, you you present your PhD dissertation like today, Maria Clara, in the afternoon, yes. and she approved the final version and go and this uh, uh, approve it, and for us our rules, the candidate can share the final version in the internet as a repository repository of the thesis or the defense dissertation? I don't know. So there are different rules. Uh, there are different common, uh, whatever, common practice of how to, there is archive, there are things which are not copyrighted. But if you publish in the series publisher, Elsevier, they claim all the copyright. We had a case, I can tell you the case. We were making a paper with Thorsten Wagner. He used a figure of his own paper, of his model, in uh, Penn State University when he was yeah. there. So he put this figure. And publisher said, this figure is from a paper of five years ago. How uh, to me? You have to ask permission of the publisher. We ask permission of the publisher. They say, we give you permission, pay us $100, and figure is yours. So Torsten had to pay 100 We didn't do it. He redraw the figure, of course. But uh, they charged $100 for this. You're welcome to do it, but why? So if you put it on web, on the web page, on your uh, uh, web page, uh, and it becomes public property, but give a reference in your paper uh, to these figures that uh, original of this figure is there, and that's it. But that's the reason some people, or some authors, are choosing paying to be open access and to claim the common uh, property. Yes, of you can do it. Yes, but it costs three thousand dollars. So more, fine. More, 1,000 yeah. euros sometimes. Or but I said 3,000. 3,000, yes. sorry, sorry, yes. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And for us in South America, this is yeah, a big yeah. amount of money, you yeah, know? Yeah, so that's how it is. Yeah. Right, but of course there are open access journals where you publish, uh, uh, so you, but you pay, so now uh, it's different. You, you can publish yourself on your own web page, it's also a publication. But it's not uh, rated because it's not peer-reviewed. So oh. value of peer-reviewed journal, that it's peer-reviewed by experts. That's why CVs, 
value this publication, so you have to pay for it. But money goes not to these reviewers, of course, as you know, reviewers uh, work for free, it goes to the chairman of the board of directors of Elsevier, who earns five million dollars a year. So that's how it is. So that's unfair, but what can you do? Right, okay, well, now. In some case, in some rules, or some editorial boards, they are uh, making a, signing a contract also, in some editorial, editor-in-chief. Yeah. And sometimes, for some specific uh, uh, publications, they are also receiving money for that. It's a contract. In some case. But only uh, chief executive editor, that's one person only. Yes, well, only know. one person. Yeah. Yes. Okay, but there are hundreds of reviewers that work for this journal, and they maybe spend more time than that person. Of course. So. Oh. Right. Now, uh, last import. Are the results clearly and convincingly presented? Clarity is a problem. Formulation of English sentences so cumbersome, you know. Words uh, used in a strange way. Check with somebody next to you to this. Can they be reproduced? Often not, but you have to explain then why. But preferably, you put all the data on the website, give a link. You can have Google Drive, whatever, for free, forever. Give a link uh, and invite others to download this data and do whatever you like with the data if they want. It, it's nice. In environmental modeling and software journal, for example, it's almost obligatory to give a link to software also because it's software in the title, so they like that software is also shared. Right, okay, is presentation logical and clear? Okay, do it. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. But often, often you cannot do it. We have cases when students bring data and say, look, it's my department gave me the data, that's it. You cannot use it. For the paper, they can use it. Also, sometimes you have to change it, and not to mention what catchment it is. So we say catchment in Asia or in uh, America. Yeah. Maybe, but there are private companies that have a lot of data as well. No, but look, you cannot do it. If you work with a private company and you do research for them under the contract rules, contract rules say you cannot do, do, do. Well, Of course. Uh, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Right. Yes, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, exactly. So then, uh, please read this. Uh, I think we discussed all this mainly, case study, problems associated, clearly presented, logically, yes. Is the conclusion logically supported by the obtained result? Important thing, last point. Sometimes people write conclusions, and they, when you see where do they getting these conclusions, unclear, you know something from the sky. And they say, oh, this model would work also for any other catchment. Why are you saying this? You never tested it. Or will work for mountain catchments as well. Why? They assume maybe it's true, maybe not. So don't make these conclusions. All conclusions should be based on result one, two, three, four. And it's good to connect also when you discuss things to the conclusion. So you exactly point to the conclusion th that you make, okay? Right, logical clear, limitations. We discussed this, paper clear, read it. Yes, title, ah, title reflect the content of the paper. Yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, you read the title, you read the paper, Christ, say completely different. So why people don't think about this, I don't know. So, Also, please make a title, some people tend to uh, make a title <coughs> uh, attractive. Like, 10 common errors in hydrological modeling. Oh, people running, yes, what are these common errors? And then there's trivialities uh, and nothing else. So please think how to make a uh, title. Also don't say, uh, I think it would be wrong to say that, look, hydrological modeling o of a big catchment, sometimes title, you know. So, okay, give a bit more details. Don't make it too general. Yeah, but if you make it less general, then it becomes long. So think of uh, also 
Okay, it's a bit of art of how to formulate. Okay, references, length of paper, format. Yes, figures, table, easily readable, correct. Okay, English understandable, all good. Uh, yes, aha. Uh -huh. How to deal with reviewers' comments? That's a tricky one. Typically, comments are, ah, it's all nonsense, reject, uh, you know, reject, reject. So people jump out of the window or drink for, for a week after this, so, you know, really depression, especially for young researchers, because they think, oh, <laughs> this result is wonderful. I work six months, and now, oh, day and night, and now they say this, ah, not good. So that's why I say, take a deep sigh, you know, forget a bit for a moment, then read again. And then you start to re realize the reviewers are right. In most cases, in 80% of cases, a reviewer say the correct things. And they and it's value, it's gold for you. Because somebody with experience took time to read your paper and comment, oh, you should be happy. Yes, you should be happy. Take this advice. Of course, with pitch of salt, sometimes uh, advice is not good. You have to explain then why it is not good for yourself. So how to answer, deal with the comments. First, don't take comments personal, okay? So forget that the humans think it's a machine, then you have a better life. Some comments are not clear. That's true. Also, reviewers do not uh, have uh, not mother tongue. They're busy or they're not experienced reviewers. Sometimes, you know how editors choose reviewers? Sometimes they know people and choose, but also what they do, they look at citations uh, in your paper, references list, and we say, okay, if this paper is cited, then first author could be the expert to review the paper. But remember, first author is often PhD student. So papers are sent to PhD students instead of being sent to associate professors or professors who would have more experience. And, okay, maybe it's good, but PhD students are not experienced reviewers. Uh, they write something, and it's a complete mess sometimes. So be aware of this uh, problem as well. So first authors are often PhD students. So provide answers uh, to every comment. Yes. Uh, uh, that's important. That's sort of clear. But also think of this. When you provide an answer to the comment or a reviewer, you're answering to reviewers. But reviewers write to you not because they uh, think they don't understand. They think that audience would not understand what you write. When you answer to reviewers explaining them, you don't explain to the audience because audience would never read your answers. So you have to answer reviewers and they say, yes, we understand what you said. And now we update the manuscript in the following fashion. And then you pe take, rewrite the piece and put it in the answer. And then they see, yes, you are serious, you answered, and now what you write is very clear. So that's important, many people admit this. So that's important to answer to the audience and not only to reviewers. Now, admit your errors. If you make an error, admit it. Say, yes, you are right, agreed. We were not clear, we could have done better. Yes, thank you very much, and uh, I think it's just fair. Now, two reviewers may recommend contradicting things. Yeah, I have to deal with this. You can say, yes, you perhaps are right, and we understand what you are saying, but another reviewer said a bit different thing, and we also think differently. That's why we respect your opinion, but we would still like to keep it like this. You have to just explain and try to convince them. Okay, that's what we discussed. Uh, nice online writing lab, go to this resource. I sent uh, this file to everybody, so you can find it there. So, any questions, colleagues? I'm done with this. No? Good. Any questions from, uh, from uh, group one? Marina? Uh, no, they have to leave already. So they send you goodbye. Thank you for the classes, but they already left. Oh, what a pity. But fine. Okay, good. They received this material. Yes. Anything else? Professor, uh, I think we have a lot of... Um, yeah, you are very... We are very welcome to, uh, with your visit. Uh, we have several proofs about your uh, uh, honesty, ethics, 
and also sharing your time and your experience uh, in all Brazilian groups because you are in presence, but several groups uh, follow with you during these five days uh, uh, by the internet. Uh, so we are very proud of your visit. We hope next time we have uh, more opportunities that you enjoy more our Brazilian landscapes and mm. people especially. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, uh, problems and also very clever people and solutions that to be shared with you and with your colleagues in the Institute. So please uh, uh, send to them our gratitude to, sh to, to uh, authorize you, eh, your, your boss, your director, to stay with us. Uh, and also we are very open to maintain the cooperation with uh, your students, your colleagues, your, 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 uh, your researchers, of course. Um, about time, uh, also I, I would like to spread our gratitude to Setiski people, staff, Marcelo and Junior. Obrigado. They are the, the heroes Obrigado. of also sharing all this information. This information is to all Brazil and the world. And this is a lab, our water adapted uh, and design and innovation lab, the Wadi lab. People are here and people are in the field. Also, on behalf of our director, Professor uh, Edson Wendland, also this, he sent a gratitude for your visit. Uh, he's in another uh, committee just now. So I, I would like to, to, to make a summarize and the wrap up of our course. Right? This is a module of the, the school. The CAP is a school of advanced studies on water and society under change. And of course, I am very sure we have a, a lot of homework to do and to maintain alive our connection with Professor Dimitri Solomatini. So thank you very much for coming, for sharing your time. Also, uh, uh, please uh, uh, send our gratitude to your wife. This is making companion in this visit uh, to you, with you. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope, I look, I'm, I'm very, very proud to say that I'm looking forward to maintain this long-term partnership uh, uh, with you and your colleagues. Thank you very much for coming and please, uh, 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 enjoy the, 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 the last uh, hours and, and days in Brazil with your visit. Thank you very much for coming. Muito obrigado, Dimitri, por sua participação, sua ética. Uh, ficou muito claro no final a, a sua honestidade e sua forma de uh, uh, distribuir conhecimento com as pessoas, tá? Falei em português, a mesma coisa que falei em inglês, tá? Obrigado para, para os alunos. E nós precisamos fechar porque nós temos uma banca, eu tenho uma questão de um, uma, um membro da minha família tem que ir no hospital agora, eu preciso ir no hospital, é, levar na escola e depois voltar aqui, tá? Então, muito obrigado a todos, é, especialmente ao CETISC. É, professor, your last word. Last words uh, are on the screen. So, colleagues, uh, Professor Mendiondo, thank you for inviting me, for thinking that perhaps I could bring something uh, to your uh, very uh, professional group. Uh, thank you, audience, for listening and for excellent questions and discussion. Maybe we could have more discussion, uh, but okay, let's, we could have it maybe uh, at a distance. Now, if you want to ask questions, please send me emails. But my, my request, because I don't know exactly your names, I tried to remember, but I, I failed uh, mainly. So maybe you could detach your photo, then I would yes. connect uh, to you, so it's always nice. Uh, and you can send photos like this, you know. Yeah, yeah but when the email comes, I don't know who is there, so. Right. Uh, also, uh, I would like you to, uh, I would like to say that that's just the beginning. In a short period of time, we cannot cover everything. We didn't have enough exercises. We didn't have real experience. But I hope it opens the windows for you, not Microsoft Windows, but normal windows, <laughs> towards the uh, new methods, hydroinformatics uh, technologies, that is always useful to use for your existing case studies, existing approaches. So try to be innovative. Try to do new things. Uh, try to publish, because this is uh, how, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, 
performance of researchers is uh, measured. Don't be lazy to write because it's difficult. You like experimentation, going to field, and so all this. But there is boring part, which is uh, writing up. And you may enjoy it, actually, because write up and publication gives you a lot of fun. Uh, so. And I also hope for some cooperation uh, to develop. Check our web pages, look at our flyers again. If you need them, I still have several uh, left. Also, my request to you, please talk to your bachelor students. If they want to come to do master's of studies at, in Delft, it's also a bit of advertising of our programs, especially hydroinformatics, but also other programs, environmental and uh, so on, coastal. Uh, other programs, uh, please uh, check. It's not cheap, but uh, maybe it's worth uh, doing this. We, uh, yesterday I met a lady who found her own money to come to study hydroinformatics in October. So I'm happy maybe you have more people, there are some funds, uh, so please consider this uh, uh, as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.